Amen. Well, uh, y'all pray for me. My eyes just started leaking. Hallelujah. And uh, <laughs> I heard an old preacher say one time, God lets our eyes leak every now and then to keep our heads from swelling. <laughs> and uh, I agree with that. Praise God. We serve a risen Savior. And uh, he's in the world today. I know that he's living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just when I need him, he's always here. He lives. That's what the song says. Today is Palm Sunday. And I was blessed when the kids came down waving palm branches. I did not steal one of their palm branches. I brought my own. Uh, But this is Palm Sunday. It is the first day that kicks off the most important week the world has ever known. It is called Holy Week by some. It is called Passion Week because in that week, Jesus is leading up to the very purpose for which he came is to lay down his life on the cross for our sin. I'm excited about today. I'm excited for us to look into God's Word and to try to place ourselves there in the sandals of the people that were present on that day. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19 is where we'll be today. Uh, And we'll be particularly in verses 28 through 44. And as you find your place in Luke 19, I just want to point out a few things for you this morning. Did you know that in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there is a combined 89 chapters of Scripture? Of those 89 chapters of Scripture, only four of them are about the first 30 years of Jesus' life. Of those 89 chapters... 85 of them are about Jesus' final three and a half years of life or his earthly ministry, starting with his baptism by John the Baptist. But of those 89 chapters, 29 chapters are about Jesus' final seven days on planet Earth. What should that tell us this morning? That it's very, very important. These seven days are very, very important. In fact, uh, Matthew talks about these seven days days for two-fifths of his entire gospel. Mark for three-fifths of his entire gospel. John, half of John's gospel is about these seven days. And Luke, the gospel that we're going to be looking at this morning, a third of the gospel of Luke focuses in on these seven days of Jesus' life. And Palm Sunday marks the first day of this week. So our antennas should be up this morning. Because if the Bible emphasizes something and all four gospel writers talk about the triumphal entry of Jesus Christ into Jerusalem, which occurred on Palm Sunday, if the Bible's emphasizing something, we should be paying attention. Amen? Amen. And so today I pray that as we look at the triumphal entry of Jesus, that your heart will be encouraged and inspired because looking back, we can fully understand what maybe even the disciples didn't know on that day as Jesus rode into Jerusalem. Well, if you found your place, let's look at Luke 19, and I'll begin reading in verse 28. It says, When he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass, when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany, at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite you, where as you enter you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, Why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. So those who, were sent, those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, Why are you loosing the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus, and they threw their own clothes on the colt, and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. 
So this morning we will discover three timely truths about the triumphal entry of Jesus into the city of Jerusalem. Before we dive in, I wanted to show you a picture to kind of put you in the place of the people that were walking with Jesus as he entered the city of Jerusalem. You've seen this picture probably a thousand times if you've been in church your whole life. It's Jesus sitting on a donkey that had never been ridden before. In fact, it was the colt of a donkey, a very young donkey, surrounded by his disciples and other people that had come to celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem. And they are waving palm branches and they are singing psalms of praise from particularly Psalm 118. We'll see that in a second. And so I want you to get that picture in your mind as we look back and reflect on this powerful moment, this prophetic moment of Jesus' triumphal entry. We're going to see three things. And the first thing we see is an acquired ride, if you're taking notes this morning. An acquired ride in verses 28 through 36. Jesus walked everywhere he went. If you read through the gospel account of his life, you'll see him walking everywhere. And that's foreign to us because we're a very mobile society. But if anyone did, did not want to walk or, or was chosen to, to get there faster, there were only a couple of other options. You had a horse, and horses, you know, you had to be a little, you had to have some means to have a horse. They, they were a little more expensive. There were chariots, and the elite of the day maybe would ride around in chariots. But Jesus walked most of the time except for when he wanted to, to take a boat. And even then, sometimes he walked. I mean, that's a whole other story. But he could walk on the water. This is so not typical of Jesus. And so do you remember how I said anything that the Bible emphasized we should be paying close attention to? We should also pay close attention to unique things in the Bible, things we've never seen before. Jesus has been to Jerusalem before, but on this particular occasion, instead of walking like normal, he pauses outside of the city suburbs there, if you will, beside Bethany and Bethphage, and he sends two of his disciples into town to find a ride. And it's not just any ride. It's a donkey. I mean, if Jesus was choosing to ride into the city, there were other options at his disposal. Yet he chose specifically a donkey, which is not known as the Escalade of animals. I mean, think about it. Have you ever seen a grown man riding a donkey? They ride them to this day in the Middle East. It is not a classy endeavor. I mean, donkeys are so short, especially young ones, that, that if you're a, a man of any stature, you almost have to hold your feet up while he's going so your feet don't drag. Not to mention the fact that this donkey had never been risen, ridden. That's a miracle that we often overlook. Did you know that if you want to ride a donkey, you have to break a donkey just like you break a horse? This donkey is unbroken. That is a miracle that Jesus calmly rode this donkey into Jerusalem. But our Lord's preference is important. And, and you have to ask the question, why did he ride? And why did he ride what he rode? And there are three reasons that I want to jump into today because they're all important. Did you know that Jesus' preference painted a picture for the people that were gathered there that day? Jesus was associating himself with the common man, the average guy, the guy that can't afford a horse, the guy that doesn't own a chariot. He is a person of the people. Not only did he pick a donkey, he picked a young donkey that had never been ridden. He was, he was showing something. He was showing humility. He was showing loneliness. In fact, when I, when I was studying and reading through this, it reminded me of a passage back in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 53. If you'd like, you can turn there. I'm just going to read a portion of it. Isaiah 53, the second part of verse 2 there, says, He has no form or comeliness. He's, he's talking prophetically about Jesus. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. In other words, if Jesus walked past you in the mall, you probably wouldn't look twice. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Look at verse 4. Surely he has borne, he has carried our griefs. He's carried our sorrows. Think about the cumulative weight of our grief this morning. He bore that. He bore the burden of our grief. He carried the weight of our sorrows. Just the people represented in this room. I can never bear the cumulative weight of your grief or your sorrow. What a burden. Did you know that donkeys were bred to bear burdens? And this young donkey who had never been ridden was bearing the burden of Christ, who was bearing the burden of our griefs and our sorrows. 
So he was associating with the common man, with the poor, and yet he was painting a picture. He was the burden bearer. Just as the donkey was bearing his weight, he was bearing the weight of the sins of the world on his way to Jerusalem. It painted a beautiful picture. The Lord's preference not only painted a picture, it fulfilled a prophecy. Any Jew that was there to celebrate the Passover, and by the way, during this time of year, during the Passover feast, the, the population of Jerusalem uh, just increased from about 30,000 people inside the city gates to about 300,000 people. I mean, people from all over, uh, religious Jews from all over, came to the city of Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, which was when uh, God miraculously delivered them from slavery in Egypt. And sacrifices would be made and the temple would be flowing with blood, but people came from all over. And, and when they ran out of room in the city, they just started setting up tents and and they encamped around the city. In fact, that's why Jesus and his disciples would retreat uh, to the Mount of Olives and to the Garden of Gethsemane. There was just no room. They would go back and forth from Bethany to Jerusalem because the city was packed with people. All of these religious worshipers were in town. And when they see Jesus coming in this manner, they'd heard about all of his miracles, and we'll talk about that in a second, but it probably sparked in their memory a prophecy from Zechariah Chapter 9, verse 9. I'm going to read that as well. Zechariah 9, verse 9. It says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation. Lowly, riding on a donkey. A colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus is fulfilling in their presence the prophecy of Zechariah 9, 9. And they start to recognize this. And so they start cutting down palm branches and they start singing psalms of praise and they, they'd heard about his miracles and they see him coming. And so Jesus riding a donkey particularly fulfilled a prophecy. Painted a picture, he's the lowly humble servant bearing the burden of our sin. It fulfilled a particular prophecy. Now, those who are gathered that are particular students of the Old Testament may have also remembered a prophecy given to Daniel Back in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 and 26. 500 years before Palm Sunday, the angel Gabriel appears to Daniel and give him, gives him what's known as the 70 weeks prophecy. Those of you that are into Bible prophecy, you've studied this and how it compares to Revelation. And we're not going to dive too far into it, but just know this. The angel Gabriel says that after the order is given to rebuild Jerusalem, there's a set number of weeks and years that have to be fulfilled. And after that happens, the anointed one will come and he will make atonement for sin and then he will be cut off from the earth. He was talking about the Messiah. Did you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not way into math, but those who are much better at math than me and much better at theology than me have figured out and calculated that 70 weeks prophecy and they can tell you that exactly when Gabriel said the anointed one, the Messiah would come is the very day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of of a donkey to fulfill prophecy and that he would soon be cut off from the earth for our sin. Isn't that amazing? Not only that, but the exact day that he came in was in the Jewish calendar, the 10th of Nisan. It's not the car you drive, it's just the month that they observe. It was on the 10th of Nisan and during the feast of Passover, that was the day in which families would select a spotless lamb that would be slain to cover the sins of their family and to atone for their sins. So here we have Jesus Fulfilling prophecy, riding into Jerusalem on the very day that the Lamb was selected to cover the sins. And so here we have the Lamb of God who is going to be slain for the sins of the world. It painted a picture, it fulfilled a prophecy. And then finally, before we move on, it reinforced a principle. And that principle is Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything belongs to God. Jesus borrows this donkey because it's his donkey. It was born for the sole purpose to carry him into the city, to give him a lift, if you will. Ironically, the donkey's name was Uber. And there's some other translations, you know. I think it was in the scrolls or whatever they came up with that. But Jesus, Jesus picked this donkey and he sends his disciples in and he said, when you go into town, you will find a donkey tied up. Loose him. He sees this. It's all happening. It's like real time for Christ. He just sees. He, he just knows. And they go in there, and sure enough, they find it just as he said it would be. And he says, when you loose it, if the owner says, what are you doing? 
he perceived that too, that that would be a problem. He said, just tell him the Lord has need of it. And so they did that, and the guy just lets him go. Everything you have belongs to God. Amen. And he can take it whenever he wants. Now, don't try to apply this principle personally. Don't go and see a nice car somewhere and get in there and try to start it up. And the guy will be like, what are you doing? The Lord has need of this. <laughs> don't do that. It's not going to work. It's not going to go well for you. You're going to end up in prison. But the principle here is that everything belongs to God. This donkey belonged to Jesus. Even the donkey belonged to Jesus. The donkey's owner belonged to Jesus. If you're reading from, an, uh, from a King James Version, raise your hand. Okay, it's, it's kind of a more spicy reading there, this story. Uh, even your donkey belongs to God. Anyway, we'll, we'll move on here. But we have an acquired ride. The second thing we see is in verses 37 through 40, and we see an inspired crowd. As I mentioned earlier, the city of Jerusalem, their population would swell from about 30,000 to about 300,000 who had come to celebrate the Passover. And these people were already hearing about Jesus, the authority of his teaching, the miracles he performed, feeding 5,000 people. He has healed blinded eyes. He has opened deaf ears. He's made the lame to walk. And most controversial of all, he has is, he is called to life a man who had been dead for four days. Anybody remember that man's name? Lazarus in John chapter 11 an incredible miracle Lazarus come forth and a man who had been dead for four days rose and lives just outside the city gates in a town called Bethany you think there was a buzz going on about Jesus I think so I think it wasn't just his immediate disciples I think there were people from all around the region that were thronging and walking with Jesus as he approached the Mount of Olives as he, as he approached the Mount of Olives, and then he came on the donkey, and it says that as he crested the Mount of Olives, you can see Jerusalem, the city across the Kidron Valley. I think they were just thronging around this little donkey and Jesus, shouting, here he comes. He's going to save us. He's going to bring us victory. An incredible scene, an inspired crowd. They were celebrating the miracles. I just mentioned that he'd opened blinded eyes. Back in Luke 18, 42, you can read about Jesus healing blind Bartimaeus. That was on his way to Jerusalem. And then, of course, Lazarus. Everybody was celebrating the miracles that God had performed. Did you know that that, that should remind us of Sundays here when we gather? Did you know that we can still see incredible Miracles take place. We saw a bunch of them last Sunday. We saw people who were lost and dead in their trespasses and sin. Trust in Jesus, be saved by grace through faith, and then follow him in believer's baptism, testifying that they had followed Jesus Christ. People that were dead, raised to walk in newness of life. Story after story of life change, life transformation. That's a miracle we should never get used to. I'm still not over it. It was incredible. Uh, we've had people being saved, uh, people being provided for. We witness miracles every Sunday. That's why we celebrate. That's why we sing. That's why we shout. That's why we lift him up. Because he's worthy of our praise. Because we celebrate miracle after miracle. Not only did they celebrate miracles that day, but they were anticipating a victory. You know what was on these worshippers' mind? These people that were waving palm branches, they thought, this is it. This is God's promise. Our king is coming to Jerusalem and this miracle working savior even though he's not quite what I expected he's going to come into the city he's going to overthrow Roman oppression and he's going to set us free and he's going to rule and reign on the throne of David that's what they were waiting for even the disciples thought Jesus was going to do that they were they were anticipating a victory and they were and because of this they cut down palm branches now I brought a palm branch up here with me today and really, the, the people there in Jerusalem uh, referred to, to these palm branches as hosannas because hosannas were used to celebrate victory. So if they would win something or if they were victorious in battle, they would cut these down and they would say, Lord, save us, hosanna, hosanna, save us. And they would wave these palm branches around as a symbol of victory. And so they were waving these palm branches down, and they were singing and they were shouting and they were quoting Psalm 118, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, save us, save us. And they were taking their clothes off and they were paving a pathway for Jesus and this little donkey to walk into Jerusalem. Can you imagine the excitement of that moment? I've had the privilege of uh, worshiping in some Messianic Jewish fellowships and singing songs with them. And, and it's a little different. There's a lot of minor keys. 
How many of you have ever worshipped in a Messianic Jewish fellowship, okay? They're singing to Yeshua HaMashiach. He's Jesus, their Messiah. And I love their music. And while it's a little different and it's kind of in a minor key, it's, it's a little exciting and it makes you feel like you're a part of Bible times. And so I wanted to recreate that this morning, okay? You have all just become the choir and we're going to do a spontaneous number. Are you ready? You don't even have to sing. It doesn't matter. All right, guys, I'm going to teach you your part first. We're going to do kind of a round. I'm going to teach you a, a little uh, Messianic Jewish song. And uh, it goes something like this. This is the guy part. Guys, pay close attention. It goes, King of kings and Lord of lords, glory, hallelujah. That's it. King of kings and Lord of lords, glory, hallelujah. Sing it. King of kings and Lord of lords, glory, hallelujah. King of kings and Lord of lords, glory, hallelujah. The clapping heart is hard, I know, but you got it. Okay, so don't forget that, guys. Keep that in your mind. Ladies, your part goes like this. Jesus, Prince of Peace, glory, hallelujah. Jesus, Prince of Peace, glory, hallelujah. Sing it again. Jesus, Prince of Peace, glory, hallelujah. Jesus, Prince of Peace, glory, hallelujah. Good. I didn't clap. You clapped. That's good. You remembered that. Okay. Now we're going to try it. We're going to start with the guys. You're going to sing your part twice. Then girls, you're going to sing. And then we're going to put it all together. Okay. And we want to recreate this, this spirit of enthusiasm that surrounded Jesus as he came in to Jerusalem that day. Okay. Here we go, guys. You, you start us off. King of kings and Lord of lords, glory, hallelujah. King of kings and Lord of lords, glory, hallelujah. Ladies, come in. Jesus, Prince of Peace, glory, hallelujah. Jesus, Prince of Peace, glory, hallelujah. Ladies, keep going, guys. King of kings and Lord of lords, glory, hallelujah. King of kings and Lord of lords, glory, hallelujah. Good job. Excellent. Give yourselves a hand this morning. Yeah. So these people, they, they might not have been singing a song, that exact song, but maybe something like it. They were shouting praise from Psalm 118. Lord, save us. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were anticipating a victory. But how many of you know that in every crowd of celebration, there are critics, complaining critics, even here this morning. I know you're shocked, but even in a crowd like this, there are people that don't like the celebration. They don't like when things get out of hand. They were very uncomfortable when we just sang that song and they were there and they were watching and they were complaining and they were critiquing and they say to Jesus in verses 39 and 40, teacher. Tell your disciples to be quiet, right? And Jesus normally would keep his miracles quiet. Jesus normally, throughout his ministry, would dissipate crowds. Did you ever notice that? He would heal people and say, shh, don't tell anybody about it. Just go to the priest and give thanks. He would, he would keep things quiet, but not on this day. See, this day he was fulfilling a prophecy. This day was an important day. It was the beginning of the week that would change the world. And he said, I will not tell them to be quiet. If I did, the very rocks would cry out and praise me. I could be wrong, but I think Jesus just told the Pharisees they were dumber than rocks. But he said, I can't do it because not only am I king of the Jews, I am king of all creation. And this is my moment. This is the day that had been prophesied for hundreds of years. And if they are quiet, the very stones beneath your feet will cry out and, de and declare that I am King of Kings, that I am Lord of Lords. So we see an acquired ride. We see an inspired crowd. And then finally this morning, we see a desired people. This moment, this entry of Christ into Jerusalem is recorded in all four Gospels, but it is only Luke that gives us this intimate picture of Jesus approaching the city you see, when you look at the city of Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, and I have a picture here, it's, it's so distant. And, and this is tourists. These are tourists looking across from the Mount of Olives to the eastern side of Jerusalem. But as Jesus got closer to the city, all of this excitement that surrounded him, all of these people celebrating the miracles, anticipating the victory, all of that faded into the background because as he approached the eastern gates and got closer and closer, 
he saw the future destruction of Jerusalem and it broke his heart. Three reasons Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Three reasons. Because of their dimness, their darkness, and their coming destruction. You know, there's only three places in the scriptures where Jesus weeps. One is at the grave of his friend Lazarus. In John 11:35, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. But there was kind of a quiet, subdued weeping. But in Luke 13, 34, and in Luke 19, 41, Jesus weeps over the city of Jerusalem, and it's a different kind of a weeping. It's more of a sobbing. It's a loud, visceral, emotional sobbing over the city of Jerusalem. Why would Jesus sob over the city of Jerusalem? Well, Luke records it here. Look at verse 41. It says, Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. You can underline that, hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus talks about three things. He talks about their dimness. They did not know. He talks about their darkness. They could not see. And he talks about what will happen in AD 70, their future destruction because of their disbelief. It breaks his heart. And here we see 2 Peter 3, 9, in the flesh where it says, the Lord desires that none should perish, but that all should come to him in repentance. We see the heart of Jesus. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And even though he's surrounded by huge crowds that are singing his praises and celebrating victory that is anticipated and, and worshiping him in a sense, he, he kind of forgets about that as he approaches the city wall and he begins to sob over the city. Why is he sobbing? He's sobbing because he is the way and they could not see it. He's sobbing because he, he is the truth and they did not know it. He's sobbing because he's the life and soon they would seek to kill him because of disbelief. You may have heard preachers say that God can forgive any sins. No, he cannot. There is one sin that he cannot forgive and that is the sin of of disbelief. The Jewish people were steeped in disbelief. They did not know. They could not see. Their Savior was coming, and they did not even know the day of their visitation. Can I say this? What breaks the heart of God, what breaks the heart of Jesus, should break our hearts as well. It's great when we gather on Sunday and we sing songs of praise and we lift him up and we celebrate and we wave palm branches in a sense and we celebrate miracles that God has performed in our midst and we anticipate the future victory of heaven, but we must never lose sight that there are people that have never heard that Jesus came and died for their sins. We must never forget that. We must not forget that we are surrounded by communities that haven't even heard the name of Jesus. We're finally tuned to that fact when we think about people across the ocean, but there are people across the city who've never heard about Jesus. There are people across your street that have never heard about Jesus. There may even be some across the aisle that this is the first time they've heard that Jesus came to die on the cross for their sin and that they can have eternal life just by believing in Him. What breaks the heart of Jesus should break our hearts as well. And Jesus saw their coming destruction in AD 70. Titus, General Titus of Rome, besieged the city of Jerusalem for four months. It was, it was horror in the city. And he destroyed the city. He, he, he demolished the walls. He tore down the temple until one stone was not left standing on another. Jesus saw their coming destruction, and he wept because of their disbelief. And we also should weep in disbelief because of others' disbelief. Why? Because we know what awaits those who don't trust in Jesus, don't we? 
I think sometimes we get numb uh, to the reality of what Christ has saved us from. And that's an eternal punishment of separation from Him and judgment because of our sin. And those who don't know Jesus as their Savior, the same awaits them. Future destruction. Yet we drive by them without even thinking. We walk by them without even thinking. We live by them without even sharing. The fact of the matter is this. The prince who came in peace to Jerusalem that day will one day come as the king who comes in judgment. One of Jesus' closest disciples, John, he referred to him as the beloved disciple, very close to, to Jesus, was there through all of Jesus' ministry, heard all of Jesus' teaching, saw all of Jesus' miracles, saw Jesus transfigured before his very eyes. He was there on this day as Jesus was riding into Jerusalem. He heard all of the praise. He heard what people were saying, but he records in his gospel, not even we, the disciples, understood everything that was going on that day. We didn't get it until Jesus ascended. And then we look back and we're like, oh, that's a fulfillment of Zechariah 9. Maybe this is the Daniel prophecy uh, come to fruition. And we were present. We were there. John was used um, amazingly in the, in the early church in the book of Acts. And then after the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70, he moved to Ephesus and was influential there. And then he was exiled to an island called Patmos. And it was there that God showed this dear disciple what was, what was about to happen. It's called the book of Revelation. In Revelation 19, 11 through 16, we see a very different picture of Jesus. He's not coming on a lowly donkey. He's not coming as a prince of peace. John says in, in Revelation 19, 11, he said, Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no one knew except himself. He, he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And all the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. And out of his mouth there came a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Trust me, you want to stand with the Prince of Peace so that you don't have to face the one who comes in wrath. You want to trust the Prince of Peace. You want to surrender your life to him because you don't want to be on the other side of that scene when he comes again. And so my question to you is, yes, Jesus is King of kings. Is he your king? Yes, Jesus, he's Lord of lords. Is he your Lord this morning? Have you surrendered your life to him? Have you trusted in him for your salvation? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads this morning. Close your eyes as the band comes. We're going to have just a time of invitation today. From this incredible scene of Palm Sunday, the Sunday where Jesus rides into Jerusalem, the reason that he went to Jerusalem was not to sit on a throne but to hang on a cross Jesus came to die it was the first day of a week that would lead to a sinless son of God hanging on the cross because of my sin because of your sin he came to offer peace peace with God the Bible says that all of us have sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God, that in our sin, we're rebelling against God. We're shaking our fist in the face of the one who made us. And then unless we turn from our sin and trust in God's only provision for our salvation, we will stand condemned. And on that day, he will come and he will judge us in righteousness, in fierceness, in wrath. And so I'm asking you today, have you trusted in Jesus? Have you found forgiveness at the foot of the cross? He died for you. He died for me. Have you given your life to Jesus this morning? If I had a thousand lives to live, I'd give them all to Jesus. Not because of the hope of heaven, that's great, yeah, but because of the purpose 
and the peace that he gives now in my life. I know why I'm alive. I know what I'm supposed to do with my life. And it's priceless. Will you stand with me this morning? Maybe you're here today and you never put your faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. All you have to do is pray something like this. God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve your condemnation. I know I deserve your judgment, but I ask you to forgive my sins. Not because I deserve it, but because Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And his blood covers me, washes me clean. I pray that you would save me. Just like the people in the crowd cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, save us, Lord. I cry out to you this morning and I ask you to save me. Give me eternal life. In Jesus' name. If you're here this morning and you prayed that prayer, in just a few moments we're going to open the altars and you have an opportunity to come forward, I encourage you to step out of your seat, come down, tell somebody in front, I prayed to receive Jesus as my Savior. I encourage you to do that in just a moment. We will celebrate with you. We will rejoice with you because we've all done the same thing and it's changed our lives. So if you need to trust Jesus in a few moments as the music starts, I'm going to ask you to come out and make that decision. Perhaps you're here today and you're over your salvation. And by that I mean you're no longer heartbroken over the condition of lost people. Did you know that, that gay people are not our enemies? Muslims are not our enemies. Immigrants are not our enemies. Members of a certain political party, they're not our enemies. All of those people are people for whom Christ died. They should be objects of our compassion. They should be objects of our love. They should be objects of our prayer. We should be reaching out to them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We should be heartbroken over their condition. And they surround this church. They surround your home. They're all across Fort Worth. And Jesus has put us here to share with them the truth of the gospel. We need to do that. So maybe you're here this morning and you need to pray. You need to say, God, break my heart for the lost. Help me to weep for the things that cause you to weep. If you're here this morning, you need to do business. I encourage you to do that in just a moment as we sing. Father, we thank you for your word. And Jesus, thank you that we can look back on this amazing moment and understand that you are the Messiah. You are the promised one that fulfilled prophecy, that performed miracles, that said if you tear down this temple, referring to yourself, that you would raise it up in three days. You lived a sinless life. You died on the cross for our sins. You were buried, and three days later, you rose from the dead, proving you are the Son of God, the only one able to save. I pray if there's one here that doesn't know you as Savior, Holy Spirit, that you'd open their eyes, open their minds, change their heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If the Holy Spirit's speaking to you, I encourage you to come as we